All right, we are live on YouTube and live on Zoom. Good morning. Uh, it just never gets old watching the attendee numbers just, you know, go up as everyone enters the Zoom room. I just love it. Good morning and welcome to the Summer 2021 K-12 Teaching Academy, hosted by the Lurie College of Education at San Jose State University. I am so glad to have you here this morning with all of us. We will begin soon, but in the meantime, please go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat. Do make sure that you have it um, assigned to or send to all panelists and attendees so that everyone in our webinar today can see who is here with us. Good morning. Good morning, Carrie. Begin soon, but in the meantime, go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat and make sure that you have it sent to all panelists and attendees. Good morning. Oh, Judy, good to have you back. And Armin, I love seeing familiar names. Good morning, Joy and Dawn. Hello again. Excellent. I hope this day finds you well and ready for our Wednesday edition of the Summer 2021 K-12 Teaching Academy. We're gonna go ahead and get started with just a couple of announcements as everyone is kind of still entering into our Zoom room this morning. So just in case you were interested, um, there is a recording of this event and it will be available on the K-12 Academy website at the end um, of our presentation today. Um, if you would like, there are captions available as well. If you just go down to the bottom of your Zoom screen and click on live transcript, that will enable the captions. Um, there are going to be captions on the recording as well. Um, this is a traditional webinar on Zoom, so we um, do not have, or you do not have video and audio. Those are automatically turned off, but please do use the chat to communicate with one another and also our presenters throughout the presentation. And then just a quick little plug for the Lurie College of Education Facebook and LinkedIn group. The links are right there in the chat. Thank you, Brian. Um, just, it's a great way to keep on top of all of the different things that the Lurie College of Education provides in terms of speakers and resources. So I encourage you to join today. Um, I am so excited to get started with our presentation this morning. So the title of our presentation is Queering the Classroom to Foster a Safe and Inclusive Environment, Lessons from Research and Practice. And our speakers today are Dr. Robert Marks, who is an assistant professor in the Child and Adolescent Development uh, Department here at San Jose State. And then we also have Frank Pena, who is an outreach and speaker um, at the, sorry, outreach and speaker at the Bureau and Bureau Coordinator, my goodness, I can't get the words out, at the LGBTQ youth space. So thank you both so, so much for being here today. We are really excited to get started. So I will turn it over to you. Thank you for being here. Good morning, everybody. We're, we're really excited to do this. Uh, Frank and I have done presentations in a lot of different styles. We are new to the webinar game. Um, so we are relying on y'all to kind of light up the chat and make this interactive and interesting. Um, and we'll see if we can't try to be a little interactive and interesting ourselves, but uh, no promises. Uh, so we're going to get right to it because time is of the essence. So today we're going to start with introductions. We'll do a little bit around terminology and, terminology and language. We'll spend some time with application and then we'll close out with conclusions and commitments. And then of course we are really, really excited to talk face-to-face-ish um, or virtually face-to-face -face with y'all in the Q&A and discussion section after. So please stick around for that. Um, so we're just going to start with introducing ourselves. I'll introduce myself and then Frank will introduce himself. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Robert Marks. 
Uh, I use they and he pronouns. I am an assistant professor, like Becca said, in child and adolescent development at San Jose State. Uh, before that, I was a high school English teacher and Gay Straight Alliance advisor for many years outside of Boston. Um, and so I bring to this webinar and to all that I do uh, an understanding of the ways that things actually happen in schools. Uh, I've been very frustrated in the past when I go to these kinds of things and people suggest like, well, what if you like totally reconfigure school in a million different ways? And it's like, I can't do that. I'm teaching like five blocks of students every single day. I need like practical things. Uh, so we're gonna really try and focus on some practical tips and things you can do in your classroom. Uh, Frank, take it away. Good morning, everyone. My name is Frank Benya. I'm pronouncing him and his. Um, I'm mostly known as Robert Sidekick, but when I'm not Robert Sidekick, I'm the Outreach and Speakers Bureau Coordinator at the LGBTQ space. Um, so a lot of my, my lens um, is going to be coming from direct practice of um, working with youth and young adults who um, identify in the community and navigating at pretty much all the systems they're navigating outside of our youth space. Um, and uh, so we'll be talking about that today. Um, and also I will be really focusing on our language and terminology as well. Becca stole our thunder a little, which is fine. Uh, we were hoping that in the chat we could get to know people a little bit better. Um, so if you wouldn't mind just sharing your name, your pronouns if you want to, um, and kind of where you approach this from, both geographically, because we've got people from the Bay Area, from LA, from New York City, and probably other places as well, um, and kind of where you're coming from within the school setting and what work you're doing within schools. Uh, Cause I think that could really inform kind of how we move forward. Um, so while y'all are kind of introducing yourselves in the chat, again, you're just throwing your name, pronouns and kind of what you do in the world. We're gonna throw a couple of norms up uh, just because it's important for us to kind of set the stage when we do this kind of work. Uh, so first and foremost, like come as you are, be who you are in this space. Don't pretend to be someone that you're not. Don't put on a facade. If you have a question, ask a question. If you're not sure if the language is right, be as respectful as you can be, but ask your question. Also, uh, take care of your needs and responsibilities. Like we get that for lots of us, it's summer. And if anybody's ever been a teacher before, summer is also like a time of a lot of prep and a lot of other things you have to do. So make sure that you're kind of still taking care of yourself. Importantly, Frank and I speak from our experiences as queer people, but we can only speak for our own experiences. And we're likely not the only queer people on this webinar. And so we want to highlight the fact that like we value everybody's stories and experiences. If we share something and you're like, that is not my experience, we'd love to hear more about that because understanding the diversity of experiences is like the point of all of this. The other thing is we want to encourage you to ask questions as they arise and use the Q&A, sorry, not the Q&A, use the chat box as a way to kind of be like, hey, you just use this word and I don't know what this word means. Or like, I'm not sure exactly what's going like, on. Whatever question comes up, pop them in. Um, because I, I'd love to think about how we can make this interactive and get like your voice into this. Um, I, it's so exciting to see everybody coming into the chat and letting us know the different amazing things they're doing. I'm like super curious what children's fairyland is. I will be spending some time Googling that later. Um, I love the people on the call who are leading rainbow clubs. Um, I'm fascinated by, by all the diversity of experience that we have. Uh, and without further ado, let's get going. All right. Okay, so we're gonna dive right in. We're gonna start with some important terminology. We're gonna kind of break these up into little pieces and bring it all together. So hang in there if maybe you're not quite grasping it. I promise it all makes sense in the end. All right, so the first term I have here is sex assigned at birth. Um, and this is an assignment and classification of people as male, female, intersex, or another sex based on combination of anatomy, hormones, and chromosomes. We're really intentional about the word assigned um, as we use um, synonymous to this might be biological sex, uh, but we're really intentional about using the word assigned because from the point of or from the point of like your parents having this little pixelated black and gray picture of you, you have been given an assignment. Um, you either have a baby shower that is um, blue or pink and you get uh, gifts that say like daddy's little slugger or mommy's princess and 
um, you, you know, either that's going to decide whether you join ballet or ba baseball and, you know, I'm being kind of dramatic, but you get my gist is that this is going to follow you for the rest of your life. It is an assignment. Um, and so this, um, our um, sex assigned at birth um, is going to assign kind of a script to us. And sometimes that's not comfortable. That script isn't comfortable to people. And sometimes it is. Um, but um, when we are speaking about sex assigned at birth, also AKA biological sex, just know that we are refer referring to something as purely biological, such as male, um, such as anatomy, hormones, and chromosomes. Next slide. And then this slide is gender identity. And so this is our internal sense of self. So I would say this like lives in our mind. Um, how do we see ourselves as being male, female, neither, both, another gender? Um, and just also a side note, you'll see me say, you'll hear me say another gender a lot or other genders. Um, I don't have room in my little slides for all non-binary identities. Um, so I have encompassed them into another genders or other genders. Um, and everyone has a gender identity. This is not, um, you know, part of the, like the gay agenda. Everyone um, <laughs> it has a gender identity. We all experience gender. We all contribute to the socialization of gender and, and, and um, people. So this is this is an every every person thing um and then for transgender people their sex assigned at birth and their own internal sense of gender identity are not the same so um like a term that's not here is cisgender um and that's spelled cis gender um and that means to someone who was uh, let's say assigned female at birth and has grown up and identifies as a woman so there is an alignment between their sex assigned at birth and their gender identity so the term that we use for that is cisgender now, people who are transgender um, is where there is not an alignment in that sense. So someone who maybe, let's say, is assigned female at birth and grows up and is like, I'm definitely feel more like a man um, or I, I feel I'm I'm a man. So there is not an alignment between their sex assigned at birth and their gender identity. Yes. Thank you, Michaela. This identity can change and evolve Thank you for that. Um, and then we have gender expression. And so this is our physical manifestation of like of our gender identity through clothing, hairstyle, voice, body shape, et cetera. Like literally any ways that you feel you express yourself, it's, it is an external part of our expression. Um, and some examples of gender expression we might use like masculine, feminine, butch, femme, androgynous. Um, there's a lot, there's a lot more terms here, but that's kind of the, the few here. Um, and kind of a little side piece, side note I like to point out about expression is that gender expression is definitely a, a privilege. Not every person has the privilege or the ability to um, express their gender in the way they like. Um, I'm sure there's some folks who are like, I wish I can wear these types of clothes, but I can't afford that. Or uh, it's not safe for me to wear these clothes. Um, so just kind of keep in mind that even though this is how we do define gender expression, just know that not every person who wants to express themselves in the way that they like can um, for numerous reasons. And we have sexual orientation and attraction. And so this describes our direction of sexual and or emotional attraction. Um, we will talk about this a little bit in the next slide, but um, what I wanna point out is just, we have some examples of romantic and sexual attraction. Um, they, so we have terms like asexual, gay, queer, straight, lesbian, bisexual, pansexual, aromantic, panromantic. Um, I don't have time to define every single term here for you today, uh, but I will kind of give you a little note um, there. If you, the term example um, or the term here, asexual, um, anytime you see a letter A in front of something, just know that it means not in the existence of. So someone who is asexual does not experience any sexual attraction. So if you just see that letter in front of any other term, just know that is probably what it means. It's not in the existence of. Other term I like to point out to you is queer, um, that I'm sure some of you know queer as a as a negative term. Um, and so we have reclaimed that word queer and it's now a word of, of uh, empowerment and, and it's really, it's definitely a community term. Um, it's also a generational term. There are some folk, older folks in our community who do not like this term as I totally understand as this word was once rooted in violence for them. Um, but younger folks and probably the folks that you'll be working with based off who I saw who's here in the chat, love this word, fully embrace this word. Again, how you use it um, definitely goes a long way. Um, other term here I want to point out is pansexual. Um, this, um, I would say, is synonymous to bisexual, uh, but it's more of an updated term. So the root word bi meaning system of two, like man and woman. Um, and the root word pan and pansexual means all. 
So just saying like we acknowledge that there's other genders that fall outside of our binary system. Um, and I have the potential to be attracted to all of those folks. Pansexual's cute little saying is hearts, not parts. Next slide, Robert. Okay, so now bringing it all together, this is the gender unicorn. And again, we all experience gender, so we are all this unicorn. So I'd like to, for you to kind of envision yourself as we go along through this. Um, and also I'd like you to think of these arrows here. And um, I am no mathematician, but from what I remember from math is that you can move along an arrow at any point. Um, you can you could slide, um, you know, side to side. Um, and so with this, you can um, slide these little things on the arrow side to side. It doesn't have to solely be one. It could be a combination of all three or, or one. Um, and so just kind of, um, and then also I would kind of describe it as like, um, an abacus, like if you remember those like little beads and you slide them over and it adds up, you learn, maybe you learned how to add on this. Um, so that's kind of how this is, right? We're, it's going to add up to you. So beginning at the top, we have gender identity. Again, this is your internal sense of self, how you see yourself in your mind as woman, man, other genders. Is Again, doesn't solely have to be one arrow. It could be a combination of, of one or three. Then we have the green dots that surround the unicorn. That is our gender expression. And so we have feminine, masculine, other. Um, when we, uh, I always like to use this as an example of like to show our fluidity in our expression. Um, so for example, let's say we had someone here that might think, oh, like I um, am very feminine and my gender expression would be hyper feminine. I'm gonna move this arrow all the way over. And that might be, have been true um, when this per when we would actually maybe show up to work in person or be in places in person, that person would have the full on updo, the hair, the nails, the makeup, like however you describe hyper femininity um, in that way. But now that we live our life in a more virtual world, and maybe I'm just speaking for myself and living our life mostly in sweatpants or pajamas, maybe that feminine expression isn't gonna be as all the way on this side as it once was. Maybe it's only sometimes, or maybe it's only half the time, and maybe there's some other um, expression of masculine and feminine. So just a, uh, like one example of how our um, expression can vary day by day, event, um, whether we're in the workplace, there's so many things that is gonna impact our expression and how we feel comfortable um, expressing ourselves. Then we have the sex assigned at birth. And if you note, this is the only one that doesn't have arrows. So this is again, our biological sex. Um, so we have female, male, and intersex. Um, and to define the term intersex for you, and this is definitely a term I, I really encourage you to do some more um, homework on, um, but the very general definition um, is uh, people who are at birth were not able to um, mark an F or an M on their birth certificate and for various reasons, um, but it mostly is um, this. And the other thing about intersex bodies is that no two intersex bodies are the same. Um, so some people can know at birth, some people know way later in life, uh, but there is a longstanding like history of intersex people and the medical community. So I really encourage you to um, do some your own research there because that's a whole other hour in itself on intersex bodies. Um, then we have um, physical attraction and emotional attraction. So we have these two hearts separate because we often fuse them together and we think that they need to be fused together in order to exist. But the reality is, is there, there are plenty of people such as asexual people who don't experience any physical attraction, but that doesn't mean they don't have the, the potential of emotional attractions um, or platonic relationships. Um, so we have them separate to just really show that they're, you know, they just don't need to be together to exist. Um, and so who would you see yourself attracted to in a physical sense um, or women, men, and same thing with emotional women or men or other genders. Um, and I, the, uh, the kind of like side note I always like to make about this is that we are a lot, a common response to someone who is um, young or who we feel is too young to come out um, is, oh, like, how do you know you're gay? Like you're only seven, right? Because we, we so focused, we're, we're so focused on physical and we think, oh, like how is a seven-year-old know that they are physically attracted to other people of the same gender, right? But again, we don't, it, it's not in that, in that sense of, it doesn't always have to be physical. It can be an emotional attraction. It can be an intense emotional attraction, or it could be a physical attraction. We don't know. People are, young people are going through puberty so young these days. Um, so just kind of giving the, an example of that, you know, our, um, our physical and emotional attraction does not need to be fused together in order to exist. And uh, I'm sorry, there's a kind of a little point here I want to make um, about the trans student, the 
here. Um, they have, if this is something you want to bring to your classroom, I super encourage that. They have on this website, they have a black and white version of it. So if you want to do a color activity with your students, they also have it in multiple languages as well. So if you want to send it home and be with parents who don't speak English, um, there's also accessible um, ways to access it as well. Yes, and sorry, Robert, the transstudent.org might be down. They are purely donation-based, so sometimes the website is up, sometimes the, the website is down, but if you do Google image search, it'll come up for you. All right, so next section here we're gonna talk about is language considerations. <clears throat> so, um, our, so with language, uh, a nice, a huge thing here is avoid needlessly gendering things in your classroom. Um, I cannot tell you how many stories I've heard of uh, students, even nowadays, I, I thought we were past this because I thought it was just me when I was in school, but students saying like, oh, like the boys line and the girls line and, you know, like all these things, it just, we don't, it, it's not necessary um, to go through all these excessive gendering things. And here are some, there are some background images here of, um, just not things that need to be gendered. Um, one that is in here I've seen um, are pens is like big for women, like it's a pen, the ink is the same. Don't even get me started on pink tax razors. They both do the same thing, no matter if it's packaged in blue or pink. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so avoid need to see gendering things in your classroom. And uh, some ways that we can kind of swap out some of our language um, we have here on the left-hand side, some common terms that we use that are very binary um, or non-gender inclusive terms, you might say. And so some examples we have like you guys, ladies and gentlemen, um, you know, using him or her, man-made, freshman, there's, and there's, this is not an exhaustive list, but there is plenty, plenty. Um, and there are some easy swap outs that we can make. So instead of ladies and gentlemen, we can say everyone, folks, y'all, esteemed guest, um, instead of him or her, you could say them, child, kid, young person, student, person, individual. All those terms are gender inclusive terms. Um, and I, I think, I mean, I have a preference to y'all. I really like saying that word, y'all. So there's plenty of terms here that you can use. Instead of freshmen, you can say first years, um, firefighter, um, male person. Yeah, so there's, there's lots of ways that we can swap out some terms here. Yes, thank you, Joe. Scientist works well for my science class. Perfect. Freshlings, yeah, it's great. All right, then um, here we have is gender pronouns. And so um, I will also say this, this list of pronouns is not exhaustive. There are many non-binary pronouns that I don't have listed here um, for space sake. Um, but here at the two at the top are our most common binary pronouns, which you're familiar with. And then we have the two here at the bottom, um, which are our most commonly non-binary pronouns. Um, and so we have they, them, theirs, themselves as a singular pronoun. The way you would use that in a sentence is they are speaking. I listen to them. The backpack is theirs. And I recognize that maybe every English teacher in your life has always told you that they are that they is in reference to a group of people, and they are correct. However, it is also grammatically correct to use they, them, theirs as a singular pronoun. Um, Shakespeare loved to use it. Um, and I think it was 2018 Merriam-Webster's word of the year as a singular pronoun as well. Um, and so it is a little bit difficult. There are some, there is some sentence restructuring that has to happen with they, them pronouns. But once you get the hang of it, um, it flows off the tongue pretty easy. Um, the one here at the bottom is also a non-binary pronoun. The way you would say this um, is they, Z here, here is herself. Z is speaking, I listen to here, the backpack is yours. Um, this is here more so for awareness. I hear this non-binary pronoun 0.1% of the time. It's not a very common one, um, but but just know that there are so many pronouns that I don't have listed here. Um, and it doesn't mean that they're not valid um, or aren't used, um, but I will say that I, I hear um, they, them, theirs, themselves um, as, a, um, most, as a most common non-binary pronoun. Um, and it's also a really nice way to neutralize your language as I had an example in the previous slide. Um, to just say that. Um, and, and with this, we want to um, go to the next slide, Robert. Um, with this, you know, we want to move away from the model of assuming people's pronouns. And so the way a person looks or dresses does not indicate what pronouns they use. I can't tell you how many women I have in my life who have short hair. And 
all have the same story of like, I get stirred from behind all the time and it's really frustrating. And we technically know that short hair is for everyone. We know, like, I can almost guarantee everyone's grandma here has short hair or had short hair. So why do we have this like need to always think that short hair is for men or is masculine? And so henceforth, any person that we see with short hair must be a man, right? So um, that's just ridiculous. So we need to want to move away from that, um, that assumption um, of how people look is going to indicate what pronouns they use. Um, and so it's okay to normalize asking for pronouns and share yours as well. And also folks should be given the space to pass. Um, and if one group person in the group is asked to share their pronouns, everyone should be asked to share. This is um, really important, especially if you're in a group setting, in a classroom setting, and you're going to, let's say, ask your students to, like, let's share our name and pronouns on the first day of class to get to know each other. Um, and then you only ask maybe one person to uh, share their pronouns because you're like, oh, I can't quite, and that's really what you're saying is, like, I can't quite tell, you know, or you look a little different. Can you please tell me your pronouns, right? So instead, just say like, can we all please share um, our name and pronouns so we can respect each other um, by using the correct name and pronouns for each person. Um, and this one is huge, especially for, for teachers, is checking with individuals about whether pronouns are safe to use around other people. So let's say you do have a student who comes out to you in class and um, this person says like, oh, like uh, I know on my roster, it says Kelly, I now go by Kevin, um, can you please, um, use, you know, this name Kevin and use these pronouns. And so like, aside from, you know, um, saying all positive things um, to this person, you, you're going to want to also ask um, what, you know, who else knows about this? Like, is this something that I can share? Um, you know, is this something I can use in the classroom? Is this something I can use if I have to call home? Is this name what I can use if I have to send anything home, like on, on documentation, um, anything like that? Because ultimately you have to think, that this person may have a safe bubble or a safe space in your classroom. And that safe space doesn't always carry outside of your classroom. And you don't want to put them in an, a potentially unsafe situation at home because you accidentally called Kelly Kevin in front of their parents. So just kind of keep that in mind um, as like a general like rule of thumb across the board is like, I, I want to ensure the student's safety um, and they ultimately know what is best for their safety in this in these cases. All right, so um, the next section here is intersectionality. Um, and this is personally my favorite word. The amount of papers I've written on intersectionality is endless. Um, but what is intersectionality? Um, this is a term that was coined by Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, and this is in kind of like some pre predating the, this word in existence. Um, we had kind of this theory in our in our mind. So um, when the slavery was abolished, we had two liberation groups that were that came out out of that. We had um, the Black Rights Movement, we had the Women's Rights Movement, both great great movements. However, uh, Black Rights Movement wasn't for all Black people. It was specific more predominantly for Black men. And the Women's Rights Movement wasn't for all women. It was predominantly for white women. So this is where um, people such as Black women um, would fall like where do I fall in these liberation groups, right? Um, and so um, Kimberly Crenshaw, you know, that was, Kimberly Crenshaw is uh, later came to this term of intersectionality. Um, and what this term means is that things such as like our race, class, gender, et cetera, um, are gonna impact each person in a, in a different way and how it is gonna like intertwine um, for each person. And so, um, for, my, for example, like using myself as an example, like I identify as gay, I identify as trans, I was raised in a Catholic household. Um, I went to Catholic school. Uh, I was raised in a Spanish speaking household. Um, let's see what else, like I'm Latino. There's so many, there's so many, there's, I can go on and on, right? But all those things I, I just described to you are gonna impact each experience because I'm not solely gay, I'm not solely Catholic, I'm not solely trans. I'm not solely Latino, right? All those things are going to be interwoven, intertwined, and create a unique experience. And so, we bring this up um, because it, it's it's really one. It's an awesome theory to talk about, but also because when you're working with your students, you have to see them, you know, for this multifaceted person, um, and not just a student who is gay or not just a student who's trans, right? Your trans student who comes from a Spanish speaking household is gonna have a vastly different experience than a gay student who comes from a English speaking household as an example. Um, so just keeping this in mind. And so if you aren't quite understanding intersectionality, I have this cute little fun guide. Um, I wish I made this because it's super cute, but here it is, this is Bob. 
Bob is a stripy blue triangle and should be proud. Sadly, some people don't like Bob and Bob faces oppression for being a triangle and for having stripes. Luckily, there are liberation groups, but they are intersectional. So on one side of the fence, we got welcome triangles. The other side of the fence, we got welcome stripes. They don't talk to each other. In fact, they compete. Bob can't work out where to go. Am I more stripe or am I more a triangle? Bob wishes that triangles and stripes can work together. So intersectionality, the belief that oppressions are interlinked and cannot be solved alone. So um, I'm gonna, before I pass the baton over to Robert, <laughs> just wanna finish off with intersectionality again, it's just really um, reiterating is that you see your students as, as multifaceted individuals. Um, and we're gonna talk more about creating intersectional spaces um, with Robert, um, but the importance of that is, um, is bringing multiple identities into, um, into the person's experience and highlighting that. All right, um, Robert. Awesome. So I like to think of kind of Frank is the brains and I am the hands. So Frank kind of gives us the tools that we need to understand what's going on and the language. And that's so deeply important. Um, but I was that kid in school who was like, yeah, but what do I do with this information? Like, what can I do right now? And so we want to spend a little bit of time thinking about what can we do right now? And the first thing that we want to do is think about what it's like for our students in class whose gender identity may not align with their sex assigned at birth and who may be dealing with a lot of different things when all we as teachers expect is for them to learn material. So what Frank and I are going to do is we're gonna illustrate what it might be like for one of your students in class who might be experiencing what we call gender dysphoria, which is kind of that feeling of mismatch between your gender identity and your sex, your sex assigned at birth. That, that kind of mismatched feeling that sits in the back of your brain. And all we want, all I wanted when I was teaching high school was like, okay, you show up, let's all learn together, let's write down what our classmates say, let's get this going. And we thought it would be useful to illustrate what it's like for our students when they're coming to our classroom and they're bringing with them the outside world. So what we're gonna do is, uh, and apologies to Joe, I'm sure that you could do a more interesting and better video on photosynthesis, but I just grabbed photosynthesis and we're gonna listen to this person teach us a little bit about photosynthesis. And all I want you to do is absorb as much material as you possibly can. So all you're doing is learning, like what we do in school. Uh, algae and so it's found in produce, it's found everywhere. So photosynthesis- I have to pee so bad right now. Time. It's super important- Want to ask a question. And so let's start- What if someone wrong. uses my wrong name? Eukaryotic cells of photosynthesis- Chloroplasts. So are people staring at me? A number of cells, and you can see. You tell? We could have in a typical cell. If I have Gen X class, do I have to change? I don't understand. Here they are. First one is. Why is everyone staring at me? Thylakoid membrane is going to do organizing. Please don't call on me. And basically, that's where the. I hate the sound of my voice. I hate the sound of my voice. Everyone knows your secret. I hate the sound of my voice. The other big thing. I have to change for gym class. So, as I'm hoping you can all do. I'm now gonna give you a test on photosynthesis and you're all gonna pass with 100 because this person shared all of this knowledge of photosynthesis and you must have just absorbed it, right? No, the, the, what we're hoping to illustrate is that it's really, really, really hard to focus when you have other voices in your head, when you have thoughts that you have to consider. Like for example, going to the bathroom might be a really risky proposition for some of our students. Some of our students are terrified that we're gonna call on them and use their wrong name, or that we're gonna call on them and use their right name, but then another student's gonna to refer to them using the wrong pronouns. And that noise sits in the back of their heads. And I can't get rid of that noise as a teacher. I can't silence the outside world. But what I can try to do is turn the volume down a little. What I can try to do is say in my classroom, I will always use your correct name. Your fellow students will always use the correct pronouns 
And when they don't, I will intervene. That doesn't fix everything, but it does turn down the volume on that voice. I can say, you know, in my school, I will make sure there is a place you can go to the bathroom where you feel safe. It doesn't get rid of that voice, but it turns down the volume a little so that students can focus a little bit more on the material. I do a lot of trolling on Instagram and I saw this, this picture and it just resonated with me. Be the reason someone feels seen, heard, and supported. What we know from research is that young queer people who can identify one supportive adult, one, just a single supportive adult, so that could be you, it's just one supportive adult, have much, much, much better outcomes in terms of mental health and academics. There's something like 11 times less likely to have suicidal ideation if they can identify a supportive adult. And again, that's one supportive adult. It's not a supportive parent. It's not a supportive sibling. It's any adult. So if I can be that supportive adult, if I can be the reason someone feels seen, heard, and supported, I'm going to go out of my way to do whatever I can to do that. So you might ask, what can I do? Thank you for asking. So there are some really, really, really simple things. One simple thing you can do is adding pronouns to your email signature. This feels like, like a nothing thing to do, but it indicates in advance that you are someone who understands that people have and use pronouns. Something else I love about the inclusion of pronouns in email signatures, you can see it in the president of San Jose City College. You can see it in Frank's pronouns as well. I see this all the time. You can include your pronouns in other languages, which indicates to your students that you have a fluency and a capacity to speak in other languages. We're indicating to our students that we are whole people and that we see them as whole people. I know that people have pronouns. Here are mine. So you can feel safe sharing yours. Frank and I recently did a project where we interviewed San Jose State students to talk about their experiences in schools. And some of what they said informed this webinar and kind of guides me moving forward. One student said, I do look out for that. If there's pronouns within their email communications and stuff, I generally feel safer or more able to concentrate on the curriculum itself. This idea that something as simple as including your pronouns makes students feel safer. And I mean, what I want at the end of the day is for y'all to be able to concentrate. So let's make that happen. Another student said, I had in the spring a teacher that made note of her pronouns and would include it in all her emails and messages. That encouraged, I think it made people more attentive to the possibility of there being they thems in the class rather than just she hers and he hems. This idea that we need to signal to our students that we see the world and we know that people use pronouns and that not everyone uses the pronouns that society would assume for that. Another student suggested something just as simple as a teacher starting off the first day saying, my name is so-and-so, I go with my so-and-so pronouns. Even that would be enough for me because it lets me know that they understand our situation and that you're an ally potentially. In interviews, another student shared something that really resonated with me and that um, actually came up in the chat already. A student said, whenever I go up to have those conversations, I get a little sketchy because it's scary to be able to go up on the first day and be like, hey, I'm this random student that you've never met before. And this is the most vulnerable secret about myself. This idea that if we leave it till the first day of class and if we put the burden on our students to approach us with their name and pronouns, we're creating this weird power dynamic and this hard situation for our students, especially when for many of our students, this may be something they don't love to talk about. So something that I do, again, Joy suggested this in the, um, in the chat, is I send out a get to know you form in advance of class. And uh, in the toolkit at the end of this, you'll get a link to my get to know you form. It's not perfect. It's not even great. It's just like what I happen to use. But it gives my students a chance to let me know how will your name appear on the how will your name appear on the roster? 
What do you want me to actually use? What is your lived name? What pronouns do you want me to use? I then ask some extra questions. What are you hoping to get out of class? What's your favorite thing? Like blah, blah, blah. That not only gives my students a safe space to share about themselves in terms of their name and pronouns, but it also gives me a little in information that I would want anyways. It's really helpful when I find out that like one of my students is really, really, really interested in writing. And another of my students is really nervous about speaking in front of peers. It's like, great, this is like the information I wanted as a teacher anyways, and now I'm getting it for free. Um, as we've moved virtually, I have found that this is even easier because we're just like used to being on email more. If you're teaching in a situation where that's not the norm and it would be really strange to send out a get to know you form before class. Um, I've also done something where I've like printed out in a really kind of user friendly, you just fill in the blanks kind of thing. And it can be leveled up and down appropriately. So if you're in second grade, you're gonna wanna make the, the words work. And you're gonna wanna ask extra questions that like make sense, like what do you like to do on re at recess or what do you do in your spare time? Um, and kind of make those feel more natural for you. But it's important that we ask the questions in a way that doesn't put our students on the spot, in a way that facilitates our students really sharing their experiences and who they are, and in a way that feels kind of like low stress, low stakes, low pressure. The reason why this is so important was really clarified for me when a student said, I'd say misgendering me really weakens any trust I have with my teachers. Just because on every level, you wanna trust your educators to do what's best for you, to want what's best for you. And it's really hard to have that belief if you know that they're consistently doing something that you know is not what is best for you. This just like clicked for me in a way that made so, so, so much sense. This idea that like, I care about my students. I want my students to have the best experience they possibly can. If one component of that is using their name and pronouns appropriately, I'm gonna do it. And I'm gonna do it every single time. I've in the past, I've interacted even with queer people who were like, wow, Robert, like you're, you're really good at using people's names and pronouns. And I'm like, well, first off, thank you. I'm just great. Um, but secondly, it's because I, I really have seen firsthand how important it is. I've seen firsthand how much it matters and how much a kid's face lights up when you use their name, when you use their pronouns. I've also felt it firsthand because as I kind of said in the chat earlier, like I'm still very much figuring out my own gender identity. And it's fairly, I mean, like I'm an old person and it's fairly recent in my old person-ness that I have moved to using they, them pronouns and when people use they, them pronouns for me, it just feels like a moment of what we call gender euphoria or like extreme happiness, like it fits, like this is right for me. And I wanna have those experiences for myself and I wanna make sure that my students are having those experiences as well. I want my students to know that I care about them. And this is one simple way of showing that you care. Um, another of our interviewers said, interviewees said something like, you know, it's kind of like a name. If someone kept calling you the wrong name, it would get really, really frustrating. In addition, as we know, um, white people in particular often have trouble using correct names for, for non-white people. That's a result of like our white supremacist racist society. That's just like culture seeping in. That same culture seeps in when we misgender our students and we don't use the, the correct pronouns. When we rely on our assumptions and thinking that we know best because like Frank said, they have short hair or long hair because they're wearing a dress, because they're wearing a suit, whatever. We've just got to remember, and I've just got to remind myself, like the only way to know someone's pronouns is to ask them. The only way to ask someone's pronouns is to create a space that is safe and inclusive where they feel they can share their pronouns without problem, recrimination, or discrimination. So we talked about um, asking for pronouns. We talked about adding pronouns to our, our email signatures. Something else really simple that I love to do. 
I love to include a variety of diverse images in my slides. I can remember going to school and learning about families and never seeing a family like the family I wanted to have when I grew up. I never saw two people who clearly identified as men who were talked about with he, him pronouns who were married to each other. I never saw it. When I think about my students, many, many, many of whom are not white, I think about how represented are they on my slides? How often do I, do I include non-white people on my slides? How often do I include uh, gender non-conforming people on my slides? How often do I include visibly diverse people on my slides? Diverse families, diverse young people. Like we want our students to be able to see themselves. There's this really cool website called genderphotos.vice.com. And it's just like stock images of a variety of families and a variety of people. And it just reminds our students that there are all kinds of people in the world. And this is always really important for me because I think about the variety of students I teach. And it's not just families of various genders. Lots of our students are raised in intergenerational households. So get some pictures with some old parents on there and some grandparents and some great grandparents. Get some pictures where a grandmom is raising their child. Get all sorts of diverse and varied images so that by the end of a class period, your student can say like, oh, I saw something that represented me. Or so that your students can say like, oh, I saw that there are people who are not like me. And that's important for me to learn too. So it's, it's really important to think about this. This also comes up, especially with our, our younger years teachers, in terms of the books they use, in terms of the text they teach, in terms of what they're reading in class. It is not part of my queer agenda that every single book that you read is aggressively hammer over the head queer, although that'd be cool. Um, for me, it's just, let's represent the real diversity that exists in nature. Let's not pretend for our students that everyone is straight, that everyone is cis, that everyone is white, that everyone is able-bodied, that everyone is a native English speaker. Like, that's not reality. And so we want our classrooms to be preparing our students for the real world and for reality. And we wanna recognize that our classrooms are the real world. And so we need to be inclusive and we need to think about the ways in which we can incorporate diversity into our lives and our students' lives. That looks like when possible and appropriate, include readings by queer people that focus on queer people You'll notice that I share when possible and appropriate. If you teach high school calculus, if you're teaching BC Calc, it does not make sense for you to like gather your 17 year old students in a circle and be like, I'm gonna read you Tango Makes Three. I'm gonna read you Julian is a Mermaid. Like that, that is not possible or appropriate. I totally get that. But if you're thinking about BC Calc, you could be talking about queer mathematicians and mathematicians of color who have existed and do exist and incorporate them in. So again, it's when it's possible, when it's appropriate, when it makes sense. We want to encourage our students to share their own experiences with gender and sexuality as it relates to course concepts. Again, I don't think that your organic chemistry class should turn into students sharing their like dating woes about how hard it is to date as a demisexual. Like that's not the vibe I'm hoping for. The vibe I'm hoping for is that young people are able to authentically share themselves when they're learning about stuff are authentically able to share their own experiences. So like, for example, I taught high school English. Um, I was a little, I don't like the word triggered. I was a little activated when Frank was saying, your high school English teacher probably taught you that they is only for groups of people. I can vividly remember teaching my students using like um, 
overhead markers and transparencies because I'm, I'm that old, so I had an overhead projector, not like a smart board, none of that sexy tech. Um, and I can remember like in red pen, crossing out they and writing he or she. And now like I'm an adult who uses they pronouns and it's like, oh, Robert, it's funny how things come full circle. Um, but it's important for us to think about how gender and sexuality might intersect or might interact with our own curricula. If we're in high school English class, I'm not saying we necessarily need to teach queer theory, but like instead of when you're reading Great Gatsby, flipping that page where Nick Carraway maybe has a, a sexual encounter with another man, instead of flipping that page, just leave that page open for a second and be like, hey, what happened here? He was super drunk and now he's waking up in another man's bed. Any thoughts? Um, just that kind of thing. When you're teaching Othello and Iago does this weird homophobic thing, I think it's totally fair to be like, hey, he's questioning his masculinity by talking about being with another man. How does that feel? What's going on here? What does that, that do? Um, that kind of thing. If I could, if I could add, okay. it, um, I'll say the other piece that I'd like, love to in include here is that when you're sharing about people in your history textbooks or in English class, you know, don't cut the story short, you know, show the whole story. Um, for example, in history, uh, let's say you're on the section of Martin Luther King and we get when Bayard Rustin's name comes up, right? What a lot of people don't know is that he was gay. He was Martin Luther King's right-hand person, um, you know, was the whole reason why Martin Luther King went with a non-violent, with a pe peaceful protest. Um, and Bayard Rustin was gay and he was out to Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King accepted him, you know, so these are things like, you know, that we can see that is so important for students to see, like, here's this, this author who was black and gay, or here was this activist who was black and gay or trans and this, and like, I'm that, and I can, and I can be that too, right? And so we, we know, we recognize the importance of seeing, seeing ourselves reflected in the curriculum, but we're now just saying, let's, let's work a little harder to make that reflection more intersectional. And just a super quick call out, you may have noticed Frank said, oh, Rustin was MLK Jr.'s right-hand person. It's just like a really quick way that you're like de-genderizing your language. We always hear that phrase as like right-hand man, but it's just as easy to say right-hand person and we all knew exactly what Frank meant. One thing that I've loved to do in class is providing students with the opportunity to choose their own topics and provide options that include queer issues. Again, only when it's possible, only when it's appropriate, but giving students the freedom to write about what they want to write about. If you're doing a research paper, let students pick their topics and have one of the topics or many of the topics focus on queer issues. If they're doing extra work in bio, like sure, maybe they wanna focus on mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, but maybe you also wanna give chromosomes as an option, or you wanna talk about the ways in which like colonialism has impacted what we talk about as like biologically natural. All of those things would be options for like extra work and really cool extra projects. So we're hoping that we've kind of given you a lot of, or some at least, immediate steps you can take and some optional things like, oh, maybe I could do this, maybe I could do that. Um, it is now time for Frank to kind of bring the hammer of justice in. Uh, the next slide is not about optional stuff. The next slide is about mandatory stuff. Oh no, ah, I blew it. That's a slide in two slides. This is so embarrassing. I set it up so well too. Um, quickly, I was just gonna say, <laughs> so another optional thing you could do is setting norms like having codes of conduct to govern how people will act. Um, and since norms often talk about classroom values, like respect or courage or compassion, how cool would it be if as you're setting these norms, you include like how it's respectful to use people's correct names and pronouns, how brave you have to be to express your interests, desires, and thoughts authentically the courage it takes to stand up for others when they're being treated unfairly or badly. Just thinking about those kinds of norms. And a student says like, it's really important to think about a no hate speech tolerated policy and really being specific. Like I won't tolerate homophobia, sexism, transphobia, xenophobia. 
being very clear about that and really emphasizing it because you can't learn in a hostile environment or it's very, very difficult to do so. Okay, now cut what I said earlier about the hammer of justice and paste it here. I'm sure Brian, you can like live do that and with your wizardry. Um, we're now moving into like legal things which are non-optional. Okay, now here's the, the hammer of justice. Uh, so this was before I go into, this is specifically for California. I, I recognize we have someone in the house from New York. Um, so this is specific for, for California, but maybe New York has similar stuff or better ones, who knows? Um, so um, these are legal protections that is saved by the state of California for students um, K through 12. So um, the first one here is AB 1266. Um, and so this requires that students are permitted to participate in traditionally sex segregated school programs. Um, and that includes like athletic teams, um, like competitions, any facilities, and they thought like, so um, the law, the non-legal mumble jumbo way of that is saying is that your students who um, want to use, who any, are allowed to use any restroom in which they identify with. So if that's the men's restroom, the women's restroom, or the gender neutral restroom, they um, have the right to do so. And also that also carries over into facilities. So like the locker rooms, sports teams, anything that is segregated by, um, by quote, sex segregated activities, um, they have the right to do so and participate that in which they identify with. And it is not that student's job to make it safe or like the ability to do that. So you, it is administration's job to make sure that that is done safely and for that student. So it's not like, oh yeah, sure, go ahead, kid. You wanna go to the men's locker room? You know, good luck. No, it is your job to make sure that student's experience in the men's locker room, the boys' locker room is safe and, and any other experience as well. Um, and then we have AB 537, um, which has, has already been existed, but it was updated. Um, and this is the non-discrimination or the, the bullying policy essentially um, that prohibits discrimination and harassment um, and it used to say um, uh, basis of sex, ethnic uh, identification, uh, but now it is updated to say uh, perceived sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, so because we're um, there has been um, a lot of very sad cases of people who have um, had bullying experiences that were not LGBTQ identified, but were perceived as such. Um, so it was just updated now to, to have that. Um, in here as well. Um, and then the last little piece that I, and it's kind of like a side tangent, but I always forget to say it, is, you know, when we think about um, having accessible spaces um, for students, such as restrooms, there's a lot of, a lot of campuses now have gender neutral restrooms, and that's really awesome. Um, but also think like, what kind of, like how, how how can students access this? And I've been on campuses, and this the 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 um, administration is always super excited. Like, yeah, we have a gender neutral uh, restroom. It's on the far side of the campus. It has a lock, and they need a key from the nurse's office. So, like, what I hear is like this student has to um, go in between their passing period, go to the nurse's office, get that key, go to the gender neutral restroom come back and give the key back to the nurse's office and then go then go to classroom and so you know maybe there's um you know some so make sure like you want to think in like some accommodations that can be made Let, let's say you have that student that wants to use a gender neutral restroom feels best in the gender neutral restroom so let's make some accommodations so that the student doesn't get you know detention or whatever happens when you're late to class um because they had to you know, walk across the world just to use the restroom. So um, just take those kind of things in consideration, um, but also shows the importance, like if they want to use the men's or women's restroom, they have the right and ability to do that safely. And they don't have to go through that whole process of going to the nurse's office and to get the key and all that stuff. So just something to, um, to some food for thought here. So with our last minute, um, we'd love to kind of think about three commitments that we'd like to make for the upcoming semester or year. They can be small or large, and we encourage you to jot them down on your notes, add them to your to-do list, or if you can, complete them in the last minute of this. So like maybe you wanna update your email signatures. Maybe you wanna practice using less common gender pronouns around the house. 
like refer to your plants as they and them, uh, refer to your dog with Z and he or pronouns just to practice. Or maybe you wanna contact your library to ask for resources about queer informed counseling. Um, so we'd like for you to spend the last minute with those commitments. So really thinking about what you wanna do. And then we really want you to join us in the discussion room. We've already got our first question from Tracy, which we're gonna address in the Q&A. So click on that discussion room following this uh, once you've kind of thought about your commitments. It's now 1031, Becca, should we, how do we, I don't know how to do this next thing. No worries. Um, so what we're going to do is we will transition over to our discussion room. I do want to take just a quick moment to say thank you, thank you, thank you to both of our presenters today on um, the balance between information and Robert, we can still see your, oh, is that the book list? Um, <laughs> I, I know, you know, you just, you, you want to make sure everybody is in a safe space here. <laughs> <laughs> um, the balance between really important information and then the practical application as well. I just cannot thank you enough. And I know our attendees have also echoed that thanks. So we look forward to seeing everyone in the discussion room. Go ahead and click on that link and we will see you there. Thank you so much. Thank you to our presenters.